it comes to learning your airplane and learning what to check, I can show you that. But making it a habit, that's up to you. And this is where you make it a habit. Right here where you begin your training as a B-17 pilot. You've got a nice new airplane to start on. Got your forms, weather code and radio charts? Right here, sir. Okay. Our chutes and other equipment are already in the plane. You know, this business of checking an airplane works two ways. It's life insurance for if you do, but it can be murder if you don't. Here's our engineer. Let's get on with our external inspection. She all set, Mullins? Everything's okay, sir. Good. We'll begin with this right-hand gear. I always begin my external inspection here. It pays to have one definite starting point. You see, the idea is to make a circle tour of the plane, inspecting as you go. Circling saves steps, for one thing, and there's less chance of overlooking something important if you go at it systematically. Actually, this whole inspection will soon go very fast for you. You get so you can spot something wrong as quickly as that. But we're in no hurry today, though, so we'll take things easy. You want to know about your tires for takeoffs and landings. That means checking the slippage marks to see that the tire hasn't turned on the rim, checking the outboard brake line for any signs of oil leakage, and checking the tire thread for cuts, breaks, or other damage that might prove serious. Wheel charts need to be there when the engines are started. And the brake line here on the inboard side should be snug and dry like the other. Now for the oleo. B-17s have beautiful oleos, they say, but they've got to be just right for the ship's load. There's supposed to be an inch and a half of that uh, shiny cylinder showing, isn't there? That's right. Pedo head cover off. Check. Take a squint at the whip antenna. Their tips get knocked off sometimes. Get the hatch, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Now for the other oleo and tire. When you finish with this left-hand gear, examine the turbo wheel on this engine. Look for cracks, especially at the welded joints. Check the wheel itself for clearance, three thirty seconds of an inch all the way around, and turn the wheel to check balance. Watch for broken or missing butts in the wheel as you turn it. It doesn't hurt to check the mechanical linkage on the wastegate either. Check the cowling on the nacelle as you go. Want to make sure the Zeus fasteners are doing their duty. Spot the uh, skin covering, access doors on the way? Yeah. Well, here we are at prop number two. You know what to look for here? Sure. Next, dents, cracks. Right. When there are anti-iso boots on the prop, watch out for small stones wedged between the boot and the blade. And as you're examining all three blades, you take a glance at the prop, Governor. What for? To make sure there's no oil getting out, I guess, and to see that those control cables are snug. Check. Take a glance at the engine, too. Sometimes things get wedged between the fins of the cylinders and prevent your engine from cooling properly. All right, check number one engine, turbo and prop, just as we did number two. Okay. Okay, for number one. Check your de-isoboot on this side. And on your way back under the wing, see that all access doors and inspection doors are snugged down. The fabric on the aileron's worth checking. They sometimes put an external lock on these controls, don't they? Yeah, you want to watch out for that, especially at strange fields. Check the aileron trim tab to see if it's got too much play in it. Sometimes it has, and you'll want to know about it. That goes for all trim tabs. See that the various antenna are present and accounted for. That one is. And the command set antenna riding high.
Ball turret door secure. Guns horizontal and pointed to the rear. Trailing antenna anchored. And marker beacon antenna, no brakes. So the ISO boot on this stabilizer looks okay. Take a look at the covering on that elevator and check the trim tab for play. Okay. Looks okay to me. Check the rudder covering and the rudder trim tab. Keep your eyes open for any damaged spots in the skin. And why to hear, it's a good idea to see if you've got an elevator downspring. If it's on the airplane, you can see it easiest through this tail gunner's hatch. You see it up there in the elevator control arm? Yeah, uh, don't all B-17s have them? A lot of them do, but you should check to make sure. Downspring will affect the trim of a ship, especially on landing. Well, what's next? A repeat on the right wing of the inspection we made on the left. Except, of course, there's no trim tab on the aileron. Check the underwing skin and access doors, engines three and four, including the turbos and props. Do that yourself. I'll meet you here at the door. Right. Okay, for three and four. Does that complete the circle? Yeah. Let's see how she looks inside now. We'll start with a tail oleo. Is she like the others? Not quite. This baby should show about two and a half inches of shiny cylinder. I see. Notice the equipment stored in this section. Look for anything loose. Everything should be anchored down so that it can't move around, even in rough air. That goes for the ball turret, too, before takeoff. See that the handbrake is in this position so that the turret is locked and can't roll when you're making your takeoff run. And don't forget to check the control cables from the tail section right through the ship. Sometimes the boys stick things in them or on them, everything from coat hangers to the pinup girl. You see? But it's no joke if your controls get fouled up with equipment in flight. Check to see that these hand cranks are in place. Let's see, they're for Bombay doors, landing gear, and flats. That's right. Your hat should be secure. And these locking dogs in position. Another very important point comes up here. The plane's loaded weight and CG. They should all be computed for you before you get into the ship ready for you to check. Figuring them is usually the co-pilot's responsibility. I've done it a couple of times. Well, this computer's pretty simple and it's got good written instructions on it. The important thing to remember is to use the computer that comes with the airplane. It's adjusted for that particular plane and it mightn't work on some other B-17. Well, the pilot is mainly interested in these figures from a flying standpoint, isn't he? You've got to check them before every flight, so you'll know exactly what the load is and where it is. Weight and CG affect the trim of a ship on takeoffs and its stability characteristics in flight. And you'll want to know exactly what the effect's going to be. Especially in combat. You can say that again, brother. There's a fire extinguisher to check here. Safety wire unbroken. Mounting okay. Good. Let's see about the Bombay now. We're carrying a Bombay tank here today, so any checking done in here can be done by your nose. Any fumes? No, guess not. That's the way you want it. 
This emergency bomb release here is worth a look. The lever's in place, so it's okay. Here, I'll take your briefcase. Thanks. There's another fire extinguisher to check while you're up. It's to your left, right beside the door. It's okay. Anything else, Captain? One more thing. Before you climb into the pilot seat, take a look out the side windows along the tops of the wings. Are all the access doors and covers closed? All closed. Now we start the cockpit check, huh? As soon as you get settled. We use a checklist for all standard cockpit procedures we go through, including this check we're going to make before starting the engines. Make this checklist a habit and stick to it, even when it seems unnecessary to you. Have your co-pilot read the items off to you, even though you could repeat them backwards from memory. It's just a simple list of reminders, but the simpler they seem to you, the more you'll need them. You see, your first impression of this airplane doesn't last. In no time at all, she'll seem a lot smaller to you. Now, you've still got 50 feet of airfoil and a pair of supercharged engines on either side of you but you take it for granted. She handles so easily and she, she flies so nicely. She's a comfortable 10 passenger baby carriage that just keeps rolling along like old man River. She can do everything but think, but she can't think. You've got to do that. In combat, your mind is going to be full of a lot of things beside procedures and yet, you can't afford to make your routine checks mechanically. They can't become automatic. And this is what keeps you thinking about them, along with everything else. Let's go through it. As co-pilot, I'll read each item off. Pilot pre-flight, we've covered that. Uh, form 1A. There's no doubt about the importance of Form 1A. It tells you a lot of things you want to know about the airplane. Uh, be sure to note the exact amount of fuel it says we have aboard. The ship's on a red diagonal, I see, because of some minor defects. Think she's okay to fly? Yes, sir. It's just that compass and the bomb door warning light. Otherwise, she's okay. All right. Then we'll sign the exceptional release required of the pilot under the circumstances. That's right. See that you have your radio charts and weather codes. Check form one, the loading and passenger list. Well, are you all set? All set. Okay, how are the props? Have the props been pulled through? All okay, Lieutenant. They're just finishing number four now. Item number three, controls and seats. Don't forget to fasten the seat belt. Get your seat adjusted. The adjustment lever's on the outboard side. You want the rudder pedals within easy reach. Close enough that you can keep your back against the back of the seat and get full rudder. Okay for me. Fine. Now for the control check. Are the controls unlocked, rudder and elevators? They're unlocked. Better check the lock itself. Make sure it's all the way down and latched. Check. Now for the aileron lock. That red ribbon's there as a reminder. Unhitch the ribbon from the throttle. Check. And wind it around the locking pin. The pin goes in that clip on the side of the control column. Yes, sir. All of the control surfaces are visible from here. I'll check full right rudder and the elevator on my side, and you can see the rest of them from where you are. With the wheel forward, give a full right aileron and call out what you see. Right aileron up. Check, right elevator's down. 
Left elevator down, left aileron down. Now give a full right rudder. Rudder full right, check. Now nose up, full left aileron and full left rudder. Left aileron up, left elevator up. Rudder full left. And right aileron down. I'll hold the controls now. Check the trim tabs. First see that the tab indicators are in neutral. The rudder tab control in the floor. The elevator tab control at the side of the stand. And the aileron tab control on the wall beside you. All lined up? Okay, take a look out and see if they are. Trim tab's neutral. Well, that takes care of the controls. A lot of good pilots and a lot of good planes would still be flying today, only they forgot to make that check. Took off with their controls locked or cross-rigged. Let's see. Fuel transfer valves and switch. Off. Now, from here on until we start the engines, this cockpit check is a sort of a circle tour, like our external inspection. Item number five, intercoolers. Cold. Gyros. This one's uncaged, and so's the horizon. They always should be, shouldn't they? On this airplane, yes. We don't intend to do any fancy nip-ups. Fuel shutoff switches. Open. Landing gear switch? Neutral. Call flaps. Open right. Open left. Locked. You want all possible airflow around your engines when starting and warming up. Otherwise, local hot spots might develop that would ruin your cylinders. Turbos. Off? You bet. You want that wastegate open so that backfires during starting won't be bottled up in the exhaust. Idle cutoff's the next item. The four mixture controls here. Check. They're okay. Throttles? Closed. High RPM? Check. Autopilot? Off. The next items are right down that wall beside you. De-ices and anti-ices, wing and prop. Off. Cabin heat control? Off. Generators? Off. Well, that takes care of the first section. Now we'll get set on the next. Starting engines? Right. Part of our team in this procedure is on the ground. Now, the first item under starting engines is fire guard. There should be a man with a fire extinguisher near each engine as it started. Now, he'll probably be out on your side since we start number one first, then two, three, and four. Is he there? He's ready and waiting. Okay. But make sure there's no one near those props. Warn your ground crew. Props clear. All clear. Master and ignition switches. On. Batteries and inverters. We'll start by turning on the alternate inverter and using it to test our batteries. The inverters change direct current to the alternating current the engine instruments need. Let's check our batteries using the inverter as a guide. Turn on number one battery. Inverter's humming, that means number one battery's putting out. Now turn off number one and put on number two. Number two's okay, now try number three alone. Okay. Turn all three on now and check the voltmeter on the instrument panel. What does it say the inverter's putting out? 26 volts. Check. Now try the inverter on normal. Voltage? 26 volts. Right in the button. We'll uh, leave the inverter on normal. You'll notice that Mullins is keeping an eye on the inverters. Moving the instrument flying curtain away from the inverter so it can get some air. And he's checking to see that there are no metal objects down there that might contact the inverter points and cause a short. Another important point. 
Whenever possible, we use an external source of electrical power to start the engines. To save the batteries? Right. Reach out the window and give the mechanic this. A right to the jaw? That's a hand signal to connect external power. In this case, it's that portable generator you saw out there. Parking brakes and hydraulic check. Brakes on. Pressure? About 800. Check. Booster pumps and pressure. On? Check. Carburetor air filters on to keep dust out of the engine. Fuel quantity. Tanks one, two, three, four. Right and left. All full. Okay. We're all set to go. Signal to start number one. I got the okay, but I couldn't see the guy with the fire extinguisher. He's in back of the engine. You see, it's easier for him to direct the extinguisher into the engines from there, through the open car flaps. And there's less danger of his getting excited and running through the prop in case there is a fire. Adjust your throttle so they won't creep when the engines get going. Move the throttle lock up slowly and keep testing throttle movement until there's enough friction to hold the throttles firm, but you can still move them with a fair amount of ease. You got it? Yeah. Close your throttles right down against the bottom. Now we're going to crack them so we'll get about 1,000 RPM from our engines when they start. Uh, how far will that be? Oh, have to guess, but I'd say about three-quarters of an inch open. Move the inboards up past the outboards about that far. Now bring the outboards up even with the inboards. That's the easiest way to judge the distance. They'll probably need some adjustments when the tack gets going and we can tell more accurately. All right, here we go. With one hand, I hold the starter switch for 15 to 20 seconds. And with the other hand, I set the hand primer for number one engine and pump it a few times to get the air out of the primer lines. Unlock your mixture control and be ready to pull number one mixture control back as soon as the engine fires. With this newer type starter, you hold the starter switch on while you're meshing it. Okay. Check your oil pressure. If it doesn't rise in 30 seconds, the engine has to be shut down and the trouble investigated. All right? Check your RPM. Adjust your throttle for 1,000. Number one's okay. Signal to start number two. Now, before we start number two engine, set your vacuum selector switch there to left. We want the vacuum pump to start delivering just as soon as number two engine starts so we can see whether the pump is working okay and also to see whether the flight indicator is functioning properly. The horizon should snap into position firmly and quickly just as soon as the number two engine starts. All right, let's start it. From here on, it's just like number one. Watch your flight indicator now. Okay, check your other instruments for number two engine. Oil pressure, fuel pressure, RPM. Check. All right, three and four are just like number one. Now 
will turn on the radio so it'll be warming up. Get on your inner phone, we can talk easier. There we are. Better, huh? Check estimates now, don't we? Yeah. Fuel pressure should be between 14 and 16 pounds. The oil temperature is high enough now that we can advance the throttles to about 1,200 RPM so the engines will warm up faster. Always move the throttle steadily and not too fast. Otherwise, there's danger of backfire, which might damage the engines or the turbos. Now the wing flap indicator. The only way to check it is to operate the flaps. The assistant engineer in the waste can watch the flaps from the side windows. Today, we'll have one of the student waste gunners watch them. Waste gunner from co-pilot, over. Co-pilot from waste gunner, over. We're going to check flap operation. Are the flaps clear? Flaps all clear, sir. Roger. Check to see that the flaps lower evenly and report when the flaps are full down. Roger. Full flap. Check. Now report when zero flap position is reached. Zero flap. That's all, Gunner. Thanks. Now for the rest of the instruments. Check the ceiling panel and make sure the compass card is able to move freely. Hydraulic pressure? Still about 800. Suction gauge? Four. Okay. Try it on the other vacuum pump. Same reading. Check. Turn the switch back to use the left vacuum pump on number two engine. Now see about our oxygen supply. About 350 pounds on each of them. Okay. If we were going to high altitudes today, we'd also check our oxygen equipment and test it and call every member of the crew for a report when they'd done the same. See that the various warning lights on the panel are working, and I'll check these on the carburetor air filters. These lights should change about 15 seconds after the switch is operated. It takes about that long for the filters to open and close. Okay. I put the filters back on to keep ground dust out of the engines. This check should be made with the engines off if there's much dust around. Now I'll call the tower and get our clearance in our altimeter setting. All in tower. This is 230-641. Over. 641, this is Alden Tower. Over. Alden Tower, this is 641. Request taxi instructions for 3R local flight. Pilot Phillips. Over. 641, cleared to runway 20 to the southwest, over. 641, roger. Request wind information and altimeter setting. Landing code number 27835, over. 641, landing code 27835. Wind direction J jig. Velocity M Mike. Altimeter setting W William 3, over. 641, roger, out. Altimeter setting okay? Okay. Throttle your engines all the way back and we'll get ready to taxi. Signal to have external power removed and wheel chocks cleared. Thanks, Claire. Get your throttle set for taxing. You'll be using the two outboard engines to maintain directional control. Now reset your friction brakes so they'll handle easily. All set? 
All set. Tail wheel unlocked. Brakes off. We're clear. Slow her down a little with the brakes and turn her so she's headed down the ramp this way. Use your throttles to make the turn. Brakes are used to slow the plane, mostly. That's it. Always keep the wheels rolling while you turn. If you use the brakes too much on a turn, you'll pivot on the tires. And I've seen brand new tires split right off the rims of a heavy ship because of pivoting. In any case, it grinds off rubber. Rolling straight now. How do you keep it that way? Tail wheel locked. Tail wheel locked. Make sure your co-pilot keeps his eyes peeled while you're moving out, especially when you're passing planes parked on his side. He can see him if they start to move out, but you can't. We'll switch over to command now to stand by tower frequency while taxiing. Uncover your inside ear so we can talk. Strip here. Unlock tail wheel. Tail wheel ready for takeoff. There. And in a few months, it's second nature. I hope. Well, as a matter of fact, it'll come to you pretty fast. But don't count too much on that second nature stuff. Count on this. The checklist doesn't skip anything. You might, even after a thousand hours. I'll buy it every time. about B-17 pilot training. Well, largely it's a matter of putting across what we know about the airplane, what it'll do and what it shouldn't be asked to do. Maybe airplanes are like people. You don't really get to know them until after you've lived with them a while. It takes time, too, to get well acquainted with an airplane. Time to find out just how far you can go with her and still stay friends. That's important. And men like our instructor have lived with this airplane long enough to become pretty good friends with her. So his job is just a matter of giving you the benefit of his experience. The procedure is pretty well standardized, and you'll learn to be thankful for that. Routine, like this circle tour of the airplane at the start, for instance, makes the student's life a lot simpler. In the cockpit, you'll learn to follow the checklist, because it helps you to keep your mind on your work. Detail's important when you're flying a big bomber, and using the checklist means you don't overlook a thing. After you get the plane off the ramp and down near the runway, you're ready for the run-up. One of the most important checks of all. Center at an angle. 
That gets all your props safe over concrete for the run-up, and if there's a guy behind you, you won't blast him when you rev him up. As your co-pilot, the instructor locks the tail wheel while she's rolling, so that when the wheel's in line, the lock pin will drop into place. Tail wheel locked, and... Brakes! Brakes set. Maybe here you'll switch to interphone. Easier to talk that way. Then the checklist again. And the instructor's command to check trim tabs. Set them at zero. Elevator trim tab. Rudder. Aileron. Then... Before the run-up, always check your oil temperature. You ought to have at least 40 degrees before beginning the run-up. Why not close cow flaps? Hurry up a little. It might mean trouble. If you close them, you get uneven cooling, local hot spots, metal fatigue. I get it. Just like bending a wire back and forth until it breaks. That's it. Exercise turbos? Right. You advance throttles to 1,500 RPM for turbo exercise. And you know why it's important to get warm oil circulating through the turbo regulators. If regulator oil is stiff or congealed, the turbo waste gates won't react properly. One avoidable cause of a runaway turbo on takeoff. Leaving turbos on, you do a repeat on the props. Give them plenty of time to change pitch. Watch the tax for that. If it's below freezing, exercise both turbos and props four times. Set the lock to keep the levers from creeping. And then, turbo's off. And before the mag check, another important detail. Before you rev them up, turn on your generators and check each one for ampere output. If they balance, they're all putting out all right. Ampere output, okay. Now voltage and then turn them off. Twenty-eight and a half on each. Generators checked and off. Check mags at 28 inches, starting with number one. While you're boosting manifold pressure, you remember there's a backfire hazard during the mag check. So you check turbos off, waste gates open, just to be sure. Off, left. Don't watch the tank, watch the engine. Roughness doesn't always give you a quick drop in RPM. Off, right, both. Throttle up to the stop. A quick check of manifold pressure, and then full turbo. Since you're using 91 grade fuel here, you can't draw 46 inches. Power's cut about 10%. You set your lock, check RPM, little below 2,500 on this fuel. Take a look at the engine, and everything okay. Back slowly on the throttle because of the induction backfire hazard. Same procedure on all engines. Back to command to call the tower for takeoff clearance. And you're off to the races. Lock tailwheel. Parking brakes, hold it with your feet on the runway. Less hazard if you have to get away fast. Gyro. Set the gyro compass and check your compass heading against the heading of the runway. Gyro set. Generators. Generators on. Tell we're locked. Light out. Now let's see your rider. Three point takeoff. Three point? Three point. Hold the tail down, but don't give it enough pressure to cause a lot of wheel drag. And remember, you fly the airplane. I'll watch the engine. The cow flaps open? Right. Hold the brakes until you get 25 inches, then let her go. You'll have rudder control by the time you're hitting 50 miles an hour. With a crosswind, you might have to use the throttles a little. Runners enough today. 
On 100 octane, you'd be using 46 inches and 2,500 RPM. Little less than that with this fuel. You'll leave the ground at around 100 miles an hour. Then a kick on the brakes to stop the wheel spin and gear up. Get rid of that drag fast. In takeoff emergencies, the bare belly is better than wheels. Check the light, visual inspection later. 130 safe airspeed for power reduction. Manifold pressure first, pilot's job, but today your instructor does it. Then RPM. You'll find it all in the tech orders and your checklist. Co-pilot trails call flaps, returning each valve to the locked position. Check your landing gear. Up left. Up right. And when your flight engineer gets an OK on the tail wheel, the switch is returned to neutral. Things happen fast on the takeoff, and it's easy enough to tense up a little. You did well enough, but... Don't fight her. She won't throw you. On our next takeoff, you'll reduce power. I'll just make the final adjustments. Hold your airspeed to 135 on the climb. What's our power setting? 35 inches, 2300. Let's switch back to interphone again. Do you always use this power setting for climbing? Yes, with 91 grade fuel and up to 30,000 feet. If you're climbing on instruments, you should hold your airspeed at 160. Are you keeping her trimmed? Turbo and throttle settings always depend on altitude. For instance, if we'd taken off from a sea level field, we wouldn't need turbo or even full throttle for the early part of the climb. Another thing, always cut down manifold pressure before RPM. What's your altitude? We're nearly a thousand feet above the field. Fuel boost pumps off? At uh, 1,000 minimum. Check fuel pressure before and after. Gives you another check on engine fuel pump operation. Look at your manifold pressure. Manifold pressure will creep up steadily on the climb if you don't watch it. As free air pressure decreases on the climb, the pressure differential across the turbo buckets increases. Gives you higher turbo speed and more pressure from the blower. What about carburetor air filters? Turn them off at 8,000. Don't often hit dust above that. In emergencies, though, you can use them up to 15,000. Dust that high? No, not dust. Carburetor icing conditions. So now they're ice filters? Well, in a way, yes. Filters off. Filters take air from inside the wing. In the kind of weather that ices up carburetors, air inside the wing is drier and warmer than that you'd get from the ram air intake. Fill the lights green, filters off. Uh, check your manifold pressure. Turning the filters off increases the manifold pressure about an inch and a half. With carburetor icing conditions, of course, you'd use intercoolers hot, but you won't normally get carburetor icing above 12,000. And up there, you'll always want intercoolers cold. Thin air means higher rate of compression from the supercharger, and compression makes heat. In the wrong places? Nearly always in the wrong places. You level off at 10,000 feet and cut her down to the proper setting for maximum long-range performance on 91-grade fuel. Manifold pressure down first to 28 inches. RPM next. You make this adjustment with one eye on the airspeed indicator because you use whatever RPM needed to get 150 miles per hour indicated. In this case, with your conditions, 1600 RPM. Then fuel mixtures to auto lean. And your co-pilot closes cowl flaps since you have a safe margin in head temperatures. What about the other power settings? White of use three, modified for 91 grade fuel. 
Takeoff power, five minutes maximum continuous operation. Climbing power and maximum long range. They're all there on the panel. The power setting used in normal cruising is always figured from your flight conditions. Desired range, fuel available, weather conditions, altitude, gross weight, and perhaps one or two other things. In special cases, you'll always figure your best power setting from your flight computer. All settings are arrived at scientifically. Don't improvise, plan the way they're written. And always keep an eye on your mixtures. In auto lean, don't use more than 29 inches with 91 grade and 2,000 RPM. Explain something? Try to. That three-point takeoff. What about it? Didn't it feel right? Well, maybe I didn't pull it right. I thought it was a little mushy. Isn't it better with the tail up? Well... And what about the stall hazard? Maybe we'd better figure it out on paper. Well, here we are. An old friend you'll remember from flying school days. She knows her way around. Call her tail up Myrtle. Now, take it easy, Myrtle. When Myrtle's parked on the ground, she's sure enough in a stalling or near stalling attitude. So on the takeoff, you lift the tail both to decrease drag and get a safe margin below the stall angle. And she takes off like a nice baby and there's no arguing about it. But with the missus here, it's different. In the three-point position, she's already in a flying attitude. On the takeoff run, the relative wind's parallel to the ground. So say the ground makes one leg of your angle of attack. Cord line makes the other leg. Angle of attack in three-point attitude, about 10 degrees. But with power on, the stalling angle for this airplane's about 19 degrees. So when you hold the tail down on the takeoff, you have a nice cozy margin of nine degrees below the stall angle. And when you leave the ground, the path of the relative wind changes so that the angle of attack actually decreases. You get maybe another four degrees of safety and you haven't a care in the world. Now let's dig a little deeper. Think of the forces at work when you take off as a team of little guys who are in there working for or against you all the time. For instance, gross weight of the airplane. On the ground, he bears down hard on the landing gear. When we're ready to start the takeoff run, you'll meet a pal of his, wheel drag. The harder gross weight bears down on the wheels, the bigger and stronger wheel drag gets. That's definitely not good, especially if your runway is soft or slushy. Think of lift as a kind of muscle man working from the wings, pulling up gross weight. Speed makes him pull harder. An increase in the angle of attack also makes him pull harder. Get the relationship between lift, weight on wheels, and wheel drag. The more lift, the less weight on wheels. Less weight on wheels, smaller wheel drag. Then, of course, there's thrust. He's your power. And aerodynamic drag. He's with you all the time, except when you're parked on the ground. Now, let's try to visualize what happens on a two-point takeoff. At the start of the run, lift increases steadily. Lift takes more and more weight off the wheels. Taking weight off the wheels steadily reduces wheel drag. Then, just when things are looking good, you lift the tail. Angle of attack decreases. That cuts down lift. Lift lets weight go back down on the wheels, and wheel drag increases again. Aerodynamic drag is cut a little, but not enough to compensate for the extra wheel drag. Speed still won't build up as fast as it would with the tail down. Even on a smooth runway, you'll need more room and maybe 20 or 30 miles an hour more speed to get off than if you'd kept your tail down. If the runway's messed up with mud or slush or water, maybe you won't get off at all in the space you have. But keep the tail down. Take advantage of the three-point angle of attack and lift goes to work on gross weight right away. Wheel drag gets smaller and smaller. You'll be airborne at maybe 100 miles an hour and without using up all your runway. And that's something to remember when you're lined up on a nice homemade strip in the jungle 
with mud underneath you and trees dead ahead. Well, how do you like her? Try a little problem when you get over the field. Say you're coming in after a long mission, you're a little short on gas, and when you arrive, the field's closed in. Beeline for an alternate base. No, Sal, you're the hell and gone from nowhere. You're lucky to have one base to come home to. I'll cut the end boards and hang around until she opens up. Well, you're to hover all right, but don't cut the end boards. She'll burn more coal on two than she will on four on long-range settings. Think it over. All right, here we are. Granite stuff straight as below, up to, say, 2,000. Don't know when we'll be able to find a hole in it. Instrument letdown's out. What are you going to do? Don't you like it up here? Like it better down a bit if I'm low on fuel. Need less power and less fuel for a given indicated airspeed. Air is not so thin. Props take fewer horses. Okay, that's part of it. When you get down to 8,000, you give the command for carburetor filters on, and you finally level off at around 500 feet above your theoretical overcast. When you level off above the overcast, the idea is to keep from going places. Now, that's simple. Cut your speed down to 120, even if you have to reduce your RPM to 1250 to get it. Try it first with 1,400 RPM. All right, reduce manifold pressure. Try it with 26 inches. Jettison the bombardier. Now, your weight's all right. You've used up most of your gas on the way home, and I hope you didn't bring any bombs back. Cut your RPM down a little more. 1250's the minimum. With this hovering maneuver, fuel consumption's cut down to about 95 gallons an hour. At the end of a mission, you'll have a light load, so it's absolutely safe. Keep your banks at a 10-degree angle, just sit it out. Regular helicopter. Time to go in, then. Landing instructions from the tower, weather, altimeter setting, and back to work again. When you're ready for a landing, be sure your co-pilot runs through the checklist. No matter how good you are, flying means fatigue, and fatigue does things to your memory. So if you want to bring in this property without an insurance claim, have everything checked in order. Altimeter, okay. Crew positions. Automatic pilot, off. Crew members at their proper stations. Side guns stowed. Ball turret guns up and pointing rear. Booster pumps on. Your power plant should be ready for full takeoff power in case a go-around is necessary. Mixtures auto-rich, intercoolers cold, carburetor filters on, wing de-icers off. That's important. Wing de-icer operation changes the stalling characteristics of the airplane. Tower, this is 641 on downwind leg, over. 641 on downwind leg, cleared to land, wheels down, over. Roger. Landing gear down.
Down left. Down right. Tail wheel down, trailing antenna in. Check brakes and hydraulic pressure. Brakes okay. Pressure around 750. RPM, 2100. Turbos, set. Now we have power immediately available for a go-around if we need it. Flaps should be lowered on the downwind leg, but not until air speed's below 147. One-third flaps on the downwing leg, full flaps on final approach. And if you have to go around, you don't need to milk up your flaps. They'll come up slowly enough. You hold airspeed at 130 indicated on the base leg of the pattern. Then, in a matter of seconds, you make your bank into the final approach. Full flaps. High RPM. 120. 115. Don't close your throttles until you're sure of a landing. 112, 110, freezer on. Hydraulic pressure's okay, otherwise you'd gun her and take off again. All flaps open and locked. Turbos off. Booster pumps off. Wing flaps up. Get them up sooner if you have a muddy runway. Tail wheel unlocked. Generator. Generators off. Cutting the inboard engines is a co-pilot's duty normally. The pilot should keep his mind on his taxi. But it's quiet on the hangar apron today, and the instructor asks you to do it. Good thing, too, since you weren't too sharp about it. You can cut your inboards now. Uh, check turbos off first. You need engine oil pressure to open the wastegates. No, no. Rev them up to a thousand before you cut them. Parking brakes? No, hold it until the chocks are in. If you set your brakes on hot drums, you'll bake the expander tubes. Stop turning over. Alden Tower, this is 641. Mission complete. See that all other switches are off before turning off the batteries in the main line. Booster pumps off. Landing gear, wing flaps, neutral. De-icer, anti-icer, off. Inverters? Inverters off only when the instruments have returned to neutral. Inverters off. Batteries off. Main line off. Lock control surfaces.
That's that. Except for the book work. Just give them the facts. One more thing. Record the time of day and number of minutes of oil dilution if you were diluting in this. Well, how do you feel? Okay, I feel great. Remember, it's, it's just another airplane. It's a little bigger than most. But the fact that you're flying here means that you've moved into the big time. And the payoff is it's the safest crate you ever flew. That's part of it. Not all of it by a long shot, but part of it at least. It's a little more complicated than a buckboard wagon. Still, on the other hand, it's not quite as elaborate as a battleship. Make things as easy for yourself as you can by taking advantage of little devices like the flight computer and the load adjuster and the checklist. All the rest, and that's plenty, is up to you. But I guess by this time you understand that pretty well. concerns emergency procedures in the B-17. What's your reaction? A guy's got a lot of responsibilities with a big plane like that. A lot of things to think about, even when everything's okay. Nothing had better go wrong. Fly until the wings fall off, I always say. Of course, that makes me a hot pilot, but so what? You can't fly an airplane straight and level all the time. Emergencies? What you do about them sort of depends, doesn't it? Sounds logical. Go on. Well, I mean, there's a lot of different things that can go wrong. Depends on what the trouble is and what the circumstances are. Sometimes there's only one thing you can do. Sure, hit the sill. Back to the solid stuff. But that's only if the plane can't be flown and can't be landed. You can land her when you can't fly her sometimes, and without a landing field, too. Sure. Slide her in, place her belly gently on the ground, and slide for home. A little hard on the props. And the ball turret. Yeah, but plenty of guys have walked away from those, and a lot of times a plane's a long way from being a total loss. Uh, does that uh, answer your question? Well, in a way. But for movie purposes, can't you think of some emergencies with happy endings? Oh, sure. You don't always wind up on the ground. Keep them flying. Well, say, for instance, you're cruising along smooth as silk. Everything seems to be fine. You're putting a big, fat OK in your performance log. You wonder if maybe the bombardier will give you one of his 23 sandwiches. When suddenly your co-pilot whips around and yells at you, Fire in number four engine. And in a few seconds, you've done about all you can do, except hope and maybe pray a little. Speed is the thing. Good point, Captain Scott. Can you slow it down enough to explain the reasons for some of the things you did? Well, sure, I guess so. Fire has to be fed by something, I figure. In an engine, that'd be gas and oil. They're the number one enemy, so I take care of them first. By shutting off the gas. Fuel shut off, valve closed, booster pump off. Then I feather it. So if an oil line's opened up, oil won't be squirting around in there, feeding the fire. During all this, I make plenty sure I'm shutting down the engine that's on fire and not some other engine. 
How about opening that throttle before you feather to get rid of the fuel ahead of the shutoff valve? Could be done, but it means waiting five or six seconds to start feathering. And if it's oil instead of gas that's burning, you just wasted time. Anyhow, unless you're in a descent, you're ordinarily drawing enough power for the carburetor to help meter out that gas during the feathering. You can usually tell whether it's a gas or an oil fire by the smoke. Sure, Anderson. Oil smoke is usually sort of gray, and smoke from gas is generally black. But personally, I won't be taking time to examine it, even if I can see it that clearly. I'd rather shut everything off that might be feeding that fire and ask questions afterwards. My co-pilot increases airspeed to try to blow the fire up, diving the plane, or if altitude is low, increasing power on the three good engines. Meanwhile, I get the cowl flaps open on the engine that's on fire to help cool things off in there. Then, lock the cowl flaps so if the hydraulic line's broken, the fluid won't keep feeding the fire. The only other urgent business left then is to look for some level geography and hope that you don't have to use it or the alarm bell. Of course, somebody's got to keep the airplane flying. The guy on your right or you. You got to keep up that wing that's lost the power and see that airspeed stays within the recommended limit. It's no good putting out an engine fire if you lose an airplane doing it. Chances are the fire will go up if you use what you know and work fast so it doesn't get too much head start on you. Then you can get your airplane trimmed when everything's under control and clean her up. Get the ignition off on the feathered engine, close those open cowl flaps to reduce drag when you're sure the engine fires out and things are cool enough, and fly her back to base on three. Captain Scott, the next engine fire I have, I hope you're there. Thanks. Want my autograph? I guess not. All those X's look alike to me. Okay. What about these emergencies? You got any ideas about them? Why, sure. The floor is yours, Captain Sellers. Thanks. Well, let's see. Scott here goes in for obvious things like engine fires. I guess maybe I'll talk about an emergency situation you don't see right off. Subtle stuff. Well, maybe. Say you've got a B-17 that's apparently okay. Her engines and controls are in perfect mechanical condition. Now, she should be as stable as a pool table, but she's not. She flies like a stove. Every time the pilot gets her nicely trimmed, she starts doing over the waves. She's unstable. He's fighting the control column all the time, correcting her attitude. Now, what's wrong? Her tail end's loaded down with some equipment or souvenirs or something like that, and her CG is too far aft. When he gets her home, he's got some sore muscles to remind him that a B-17 is safest and easiest to fly when you haven't messed up her original design. Now look how she's figured out. All the weight in her balances up, as though you've taken the pounds out of her structures, parts, fuel, and the tons out of her nacelles, lumped them all together and put them in a particular spot. That's practically what her designers did. They juggled her weights until center of gravity was near the forward end of the plane, a good long distance from the stabilizer. That distance was a substitute for size in the stabilizers and elevators. Making them large would have given them power to control the attitude of the wing, but would also have increased drag and weight. So they were given the needed power another way. By keeping the area fairly small and by placing the airplane center of gravity well forward. And that gives them a lot of leverage to work with. With the airflow around her, center of gravity becomes a sort of pivot point. The airplane flies just as though she were suspended from a rod across her wings. Trim your airplane for level flight and she'll hold her own. When a gust hits that wing, causing it to rise, pushing her nose up, the stabilizer's angle of attack increases. They grab a little more airflow, and that small added force multiplied by all that leverage is enough to overpower the wing with all its added force. The airplane restores to trimmed attitude and trim speed. She's got longitudinal stability. Okay, but if Joe Dokes discovers a lot of room in her tail where he can put stuff and loads her up, uh-huh, she's like a different airplane. Look what's happened to her center of gravity. It's moved back. It wasn't riveted down, it's a point of balance. 
move the weight and you move it. That pivot point moving back has shortened that lever arm, and the elevators and stabilizers have lost a lot of their leverage that they had before, a lot of their power. Now when a gust hits her wing, developing more forces up there, that tail is helpless. The wing takes off in a new direction and keeps on going. What's the cure? That's right. Move the weight out of the tail. Get the center of gravity farther forward. Give the leverage back to the stabilizers and elevators. Now she's okay again. CG still isn't where it was originally, but it's close enough. There's some leeway. The mean aerodynamic cord measures 177 and a half inches. And if CG is anywhere from 32 to 19 percent of the cord length, back from the leading edge of the wing, elevators and stabilizers have the leverage that they need. Now that gives you about two feet of range. Use the load adjuster that comes with your airplane. Calculate your CG, stay within that range, and you'll have a stable airplane to fly. One that's less tiring on long missions, more accurate for bombing, and safer on instruments. Nice lecture, Doctor. Thanks. Uh, just one loophole. That business about the airplane being loaded so far aft, it's clear out of control. It's pretty extreme. Well, it isn't impossible, is it? No, but you can fly them when CG is after 32 quite a bit, even after 35 with a downspring. It's hard work, yeah, but it still isn't what you'd call an emergency. Or it could be. Well? Well, look, say you've got an airplane that's unstable because of rearward CG. You're in the overcast and you're on instruments. You're busy with something else besides the controls, and so is your co-pilot. Maybe you don't realize how unstable your plane is. You could wind up in one of those spots that pilots have bad dreams about. such a big plane. Control forces might overpower the pilot. But that nightmare belongs to pilots who've never stalled the airplane. Not that they should rush right out and try it. That's prohibited. A stall is no picnic, but it's not ordinarily a serious emergency either. Unless the pilot reacts too slowly or does the wrong thing. I was thinking of a pilot who stalls his plane inadvertently. If he knows what goes on, sure, he'll be okay. If not, it might be bad, that's all. Uh, Captain Sellers, this is a training film. What about stalls? Well, in general, well, the stalling characteristics of a Ford are quite a source of comfort. Our on stalls are more violent. Our on accelerated stalls are dynamite, just as in any plane. And most stalls aren't that kind. That's my boy there who's talking. Go on, you're doing fine. What happens? Well, let's see. The B-17 goes into a stall. The stall begins at the root of the wing, spreading out toward the tip, so that the wing tips cease flying last. That's good. Completely stalled head-on, she drops without much tendency to fall off on one wing. Ease her nose down and you're flying again. The danger of spinning out is slight because of that dorsal fin. It's one of the biggest vertical stabilizers in the business, and it gives the airplane directional stability. So her tendency, instead of spinning out of a stall, is to hold the direction in which she originally stalled. That's good, too. When you stall on a turn, of course, you've got a low wing to think about. Use the rudder to lift it. Never use aileron to recover from a stall. It'll only make things worse. And your control reaction should be immediate, but moderate, never violent. You don't need to dive her. 
Ease her down as soon as you get the stall warning. Warning usually comes about five miles an hour ahead of the stalling speed of the airplane. The tail buffets and you know something's about to happen. And you usually have plenty of time to recover during that warning period. Don't slam her nose down. Just bring it down easily to the horizon. And you've got full control again. She won't even settle much. Go into action when you get that stall warning. Chances are you won't ever get into a really violent stall. In any case, if your plane's loaded right, you'll have both longitudinal and directional stability to help you keep out of trouble. Those two and a combination of a good working knowledge of your plane is all you need. Sellers, where'd you get all that book learning? Book learning? One kind of a stall you overlooked. A lot of guys were afraid of it. What's that? Stall when you retract wing flaps. Like on a go-around, where you're pretty close to the ground and can't afford to lose altitude. Well, what about it? Sure, Anderson, you give out for a chain. How much to it? You won't stall when you spill your flaps if you're above flaps up stalling speed of your plane. Reassuring, Captain. Uh, care to go into the reasons why? Well, it's really pretty simple. I'm not much on studying. Books, I mean. Like sellers. Say, listen. So I asked a guy about it one time when I had the chance. He's one of those aerodynamicists who works in the wind tunnel. Pretty smart Joe. The way he explained it, here's the wing of your airplane. Its angle is always the same in relation to the airplane. The angle at which it attacks the airflow is subject to change. Change the angle of attack, and you vary the amount of lift developed by the wing. Steeper angle, greater lift. Of course, you do that by changing the attitude of your airplane. But there's another way you can get about the same effect. Lower your wing flap. It's just as though you'd increase the wing's angle of attack by nosing the airplane up. All right. Your flying flaps down. Your airplane speed and attitude are adjusted to that condition. And then you retract those flaps. What happens? You lose some of the lift. The trim of the plane changes. There's less downwash in the tail. It rises. The airplane noses down a little and picks up speed. Quite a bit of speed, in fact, because you've also lost flap drag. Now, that's all satisfactory, except that loss in altitude. If you don't want that, you'll have to do something else. Flaps down again. Now, this time, as they come up, pull the nose of your airplane up. So the wing's actual angle of attack will be the same when flaps are up as, as it was for all practical purposes when flaps are down. Now, have you lost anything? Not altitude, certainly. By pulling the nose up, you kept the lifting power of the wing constant. And you've gained some speed because you've lost the drag of those flaps. Just watch your airspeed. As long as the airspeed is above stalling speed of the plane with the flaps up, you can spill them, pull her nose up to hold altitude without fear of stalling her. Okay? Useful information. How do you apply it? Like I said, when you have to make a go-around or almost any time you want to spill flaps and keep altitude. Like in the short distance takeoff I did one time with a student. An emergency takeoff? Let's hear about it. You're stuck for an explanation now, Andy. Hmm. Ordinarily, there's nothing to it, really. How do you do it? <laughs> okay. You use one-third wing flaps, 15 degrees, to increase lift of the wing. That takes weight off the wheels, cuts down wheel drag faster, so you get up more speed and get off sooner. Also, you run your engines up to full military power before releasing the brakes. Get more speed from the start. It's a good trick if you've got a runway that apt to slow you down a bit. Slush, mud, turf. Or if you've got a runway that's a little shorter than it should be. This one time, the runway was a little short, with an obstacle at the end of it, and not the kind you'd pick if you had a choice student with me didn't like it any better than I did. But he doesn't scare easy. He sizes up the situation and goes to work. When everything's set, he orders one-third flaps. And we get the flap set. Then he pours the coal to her, building up to full military power.
brakes off, and we're on our way. I don't have to coach you much. Keep that tail down. Need all the lift we can get from that wing. Not too much or you will add wheel drag. That's it. Gear comes up as soon as possible. Pilot checks engine operation and number four looks bad. We're losing it. Let the kid know about it. Get set to take it away from him. Losing number four engine. Get that wing up now. Right engine dead. Left rudder. Left aileron. Flying the airplanes always first. Good. Keep right wing a little high. More speed will give us more control, though. Spend a little altitude, buy some speed. We can climb if we have to. Ought to get his flaps up before he feathers, if he has any power at all in the bad engine, especially if the airplane's heavy. Air speed's okay for it. Flaps up, the kid gives the command. Those are up a little, son. Still work to do. She's losing oil pressure. And the kid comes right back. Feather number four. Feathering button first. Turbo and throttle. Then mixture and cow flaps. Heard about a joker once who feathered the wrong one. Better not feather at all than hit the wrong button. Got speed now. We can start climbing. Reduce power. 38 inches. RPM 2300. Always should have at least 100 feet of altitude. And airspeed of 135 before reducing power and starting the climb. Trim her up and we'll take her to home base. Long as we're out of the woods, we can clean her all up. Would have cut fuel first if it had looked like a fire hazard. Fly the airplane. That comes first, last, and always. Rest of it's pretty much normal procedure, bringing her back. We don't use flaps until we're darn sure of being able to come on in. One third on the base leg, full flaps on final approach. She'll float a little coming in with one feather. Allow for it. Tabs are neutral now. The kid's keeping that right wing up. Keep it well up until you're on the final approach and reducing power. I guess the kid'll do. But if you think we actually spent that much time doing it, you're nuts. Oh. Anderson, how'd you ever set that plane down on that short runway? I didn't. Brought her home where there's plenty of landing room. But you took off from that short runway. You must have had to land on it sometime. Well, oh, no. You don't get me to talk about a short distance landing, too. Oh, come on. Not me, brother. I'm all talked out. Uh, Captain Scott, it was your idea. Okay, but Anderson should have done it for you. Just the reverse of the short distance takeoff. On the approach, you bring her in slow. Set her down as near the end of the runway as possible. If you don't have much to begin with, you don't want to waste any. Lander three point. Now start your flaps coming up and get your tail up as soon as you touch. That reduces lift and gets a lot of weight down on the main landing gear where the brakes are. Ordinarily, that much brake pressure, it means skidding. But with so much extra weight on the wheels, 
It all goes into drag. It drags what you want to keep your landing distance down. You can ground loop her too if you have to. About those brakes now. They're dual jobs with two expander tubes instead of one. And there's not the danger of brake failure there used to be. But these double brakes really take a hold. Don't ride them any harder than you really have to. On this short distance landing especially. When you really climb on and bear down, you can lose a tire. And having one of your wheels disintegrate isn't going to help you stay on the runway. Play it on the safe side when you're breaking those wheels for a short distance landing or in any emergency. Use what you know. Figure your percentages and bet where the odds are smallest against you. This stuff isn't cut and dried. Some guy figures something out, he tries it, and if it seems to work, passes it on to the next guy. He's done some figuring for himself and probably knows a better way. Sure. Anderson here doesn't speak many English, but what he means is keep your mind open. Work at it all the time. Nobody has a last word in stuff like this. That's right. Not even in a movie. sure can dish it out. And bring the boys home safe, too. When news of a successful raid by the Flying Fortresses comes in, these are the people who get the biggest thrill, the thousands of Boeing workers who build them. They are the makers of flight.
with rivets and rivet guns, with hard-biting routers, with our own two hands. In huge Boeing plants, out of tough metal, they forge America's fighting bomber. The Army Air Forces take over. And from the field, she takes off to join the fighting forces. Flying Fortress. Where did it all start? How did America have this plane ready when war came? Well, in the lean years of the early 30s, Boeing designers, thinking of tomorrow's airplane, talk of a huge military plane. Tough, fast, and rangy. It'd be hard to build, they say. A lot of problems to lick. Think of the mechanical problems. How big the landing gear must be to carry those tons and tons of weight. She'd need four mighty motors to give her extra power, extra speed, and extra punch. And the controls, wouldn't the pilot get dizzy trying to handle them all? It looked as if the plane would always remain a dream. But in 1934, when the Army Air Corps asked for new bomber designs, the Boeing men want to work in earnest. They figure her size and weight are new. She'll cost a lot to build and there's a depression on. Shall they tackle a brand new field, cut loose from the past? Shall they build tomorrow's plane today? The decision is made. These are the men to do it. For 18 years, from 1916 to 1934, they had been pioneering constantly improving aircraft design. They built America's first low-wing monoplane transport, the famous monomail. The United States Army's first all-metal two-engine bomber, the B-9. And the first modern type commercial transport, the 247. Here was the plane of tomorrow, the fortress that is to come. And the plane of the future has to be translated to the details of the big plane itself. This wing truss design must be light, yet strong enough to carry the load of four huge motors and the plane itself. And every thought the pilot has must be made to flow along a network of controls. But the job was done. And in July 1935, she took off. Boeing 299, you are clear to take off. You are clear to the control boundary. She flew non-stop to Dayton for her army tests, breaking all speed records. Designed to be the guardian of a hemisphere, she had a greater cruising range than any bomber ever built. This 1934 plane forecast today's great fortresses of the sky, which carry ever larger loads of bombs and bristle with guns. Army orders 13 planes to give them a service test. The engineers who went all out for a plane of the future win their point. But problems of aircraft design and manufacture are no sooner solved than others appear. For without continuous research, today's super plane can be as outmoded as this jalopy. The engineers work constantly to step up speed, altitude, stability, make the great fortress function like a precision instrument. They make a scale model of the big plane and mount it in the throat of a wind tunnel. 
There, in a man-made gale, they duplicate real flight conditions. And in the balance room of the tunnel, you can read the story of the flight. To study performance of a new wing, the engineers will watch these tufts of yarn as they react to the airflow. The wind roars through the tunnel. And as the model simulates a stall, the even flow of air breaks into whirling eddies. Through research such as this, they continually build up new data on airplane performance and design. Improve, revise, redesign. Your fortress flies faster, but anti-aircraft guns are reaching higher now. How are you going to get above their deadly range? Above 18,000 feet, the air becomes too thin to breathe. Without a normal supply of oxygen, the human system doesn't function efficiently. 25,000 feet, even the engines gasp for breath. At 35,000 feet, the mercury drops to 60 below. Oil freezes and lubricated controls won't work freely. Well, that's the stratosphere. And to beat it, Boeing engineers bring the stratosphere down to Earth and duplicate conditions existing more than eight miles up. Into the strata chamber they go to test the performance of equipment at high altitude. They read the story of the test on a battery of pressure gauges. And for a test in the cold room, huge refrigeration machines chill the air down to 75 below and lower. These equipment engineers, dressed for the stratosphere even though they'll never leave the ground, are going to test a valve to see whether it will work in such intense cold. No, it won't work. Not in the sub-zero temperature of the stratosphere. Well, better to have it freeze now than when the plane is in the air. But it means figuring and testing and tinkering until they find controls that will always work. It's 70 below in there. And what wouldn't they give for a hot cup of coffee? Okay, coming up. <whistles> Too late. Coffee, popsicle style. Burr ending. In the sound laboratory, acoustical engineers study sound producing vibration from high pitched whines to deafening clatters. And with this knowledge, they go to work on the plane itself, quelling engine noise cutting out other causes of sound. And then in the factory, what can't be killed is muffled until the roar of the engines is hushed to a purr. The big bomber is as quiet as the average streamlined train. And what did these six years of pre-war research mean to a world that was still at peace? Well, out of research such as this, commercial as well as military, comes the big Boeing Clipper, the ship that established transoceanic plane service on a commercially practical basis. 
and the Boeing Stratoliner, the world's first high altitude, completely pressurized commercial airplane. But for years, the flying fortresses are a subject for controversy. They're expensive for a peacetime budget, and they have never been tested in combat. But with faith in their own design, in their vision of the future, Boeing kept on testing, experimenting, improving. weapon have we got? What war birds have we hatched? The army's flying fortresses are ready. They take to the air laden with steel for enemy targets. Speed, altitude, precision gunfire are all at their command. Striking in broad daylight, they become the plane best able to get to the target, hit the target, and get back again. Fast as they roll out, our war machine calls for more. More parts, more planes. So Boeing tooling engineers look for new ways to make more parts faster. For instance, here are some of the ribs of a flying fortress. The old way of making these parts was too slow. So they invent an octopus monster to bite into metal. Turn out those ribs 45 times faster. and they develop an automatic spot welding table that a woman can run. Now this former housewife stitches the metal hide for the toughest bomber in the world. But skeleton and skin are not enough. To complete these giant fighting bombers, nerves are needed. Nerves to call for more speed and power, to tell the guns to bark and the bombs to fall, and send back the message, mission accomplished. That means electric wires. Five miles or more for every fortress. Once thousands of wires were hauled individually through conduits. Too slow, they say. So Boeing men speeded it up with a new system. Whole sections of the nervous systems are bundled together outside the plane. Then they're installed quickly as a unit. Through the plant, the tempo quickens. Faster machines are made, more efficient tools. America and the whole world needs those planes. call for better, faster production methods goes out. And in the shops, the men and women who are giving their time and their muscle, they give their ideas, too. They're gathered from suggestion boxes all over the huge plant. They pour them in. One man develops a new grommet punch. And thanks to him, Boeing fortresses are built faster. And somebody thought of a way to number parts as they're cut. This little gadget saves untold hours. And in growing numbers, women are taking over in the plants, replacing men who have gone off to war. These women used to drive the family car. Now they're driving Hitler. Crazy. And obeying all the rules of safety, too. This inspector checks hard to see rivets inside the huge wing.
Uh-oh. The eternal feminine. Here they are. Americans at work. Housewives and farmers, mechanics and teachers, all races and all creeds, young and old alike. Each contributes to the building of the bomber that has been called the backbone of the American air offensive. They're sending out a steady flow of fortresses. Australia, India, Africa, Alaska they go, making it possible to hit the enemy by day as well as by night, in ever-increasing numbers striking at the heart of the target. The Bombay doors open. away. While the mighty fortresses of the sky strike the enemy again and again, Boeing's engineering staff, one of the largest ever assembled by a single industrial concern, is building still better weapons for war. Secret weapons. And what of peace? Out of Boeing research in hydraulics and structures, aerodynamics and acoustics, refrigeration, metallurgy, may come new methods for making new things for the years to come. But today, first and most important, Boeing builds for victory. <laughs> 